All right, we have Gavin Austin today, um, no relation to the city of Austin. He's a principal technical writer at Salesforce. He's been writing a variety of content for over 16 years. He helped Salesforce radically change its content strategy in 2015, and he's delivered a number of highly rated talks at Dreamforce, Write the Doc San Francisco, University of Washington, STC Summit, LavaCon, and just too many more to mention. In fact, I had to cut them off. There were too many. Um, Gavin's Twitter and LinkedIn are down below. I know he's a fairly active Twitterer, so uh, feel free to reach out there and follow along with what he's doing. Next slide, please. All right. Gavin, are you ready to give it a good go? I sure am. Let me see if I can, <clears throat> excuse me, share my slide here. Yes, welcome by the way. Thank you. From all of us all over the country. <laughs> I appreciate the warm welcome. And uh, uh, actually, Shri, I may be related to the city of Austin, Texas from some distant relatives. So if that's the wow. case, maybe I could get a nice warm welcome next time I'm in Texas. I've been corrected. <laughs> cool. Can all of you see my screen, see the slides that I'm sharing? Yes. Wonderful, perfect. Well, thanks so much, Shri and Alyssa, for hosting this session of Write the Docs, the East Coast Quorum. And thanks for having me. I'm really excited to share some ideas, get some conversation going. I won't go into my background since I was introduced, but I will say the genesis of this presentation came about from a number of colleagues I work with wondering if our, our positions are obsolete, wondering if technology is going to take over. And uh, in the discussion, we talked a little bit about Marcom and what that is and what is TechCom. And for the purposes of this talk today, Marcom is our compatriots who are marketing content creators. And to define the second term, TechCom, as I'm using it in this talk, is really documentarians, technical writers, people that write things such as online help or developer docs or things of that nature. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with the company that I work for, Salesforce, we are a customer relationship management platform, meaning that everything from pre-sales to post-sales, getting a 360 degree view of your customer to make them have a wonderful experience with whatever your organization services or sells. And with that, I will begin by sharing the next slide, which is a actually something I like to do to make sure the lawyers at Salesforce are gainfully employed. So for the one or two of you in this talk that can't read this wonderful, beautiful piece of content, let me summarize it for you. It states that one, Salesforce is a publicly traded company. Two, anything that you hear in today's talk may not apply to future releases of the Salesforce application. And three, please base all of your purchases about Salesforce on what's currently in the application. Thank you, lawyers. And the illusions that I'm gonna cover, which are part of the agenda, and you could almost say the plot of this talk are as follows. Our jobs will be replaced specifically for TechCom. The second illusion, marketing does not like us. And the us again is TechCom. And the third illusion I hope to touch on is TechCom gets no respect. And let's begin with the first illusion, of our jobs will be replaced. And some of this kind of anxiety comes through predictions that we see from organizations such as Gartner. And this is a little bit of an older prediction, but they stated in their world of looking at markets that by 2018, a full 30% of interactions with technology will be through conversations with smart machines. Now, I know that we're in 2021, but personally, and I would conjecture for most of you that most of your interactions are not necessarily through smart machines and that the technical content that you're working with is not always through smart machines. So I don't think we need to be so worried that these smart machines, be them conversational of chat bots or AI or what have you, are necessarily dominating the kinds of content that what we are creating as of yet. Another wonderful prediction put forth by Gartner was that chatbots, yes, chatbots, will power 80%, excuse me, 85% of all customer service interactions by 2020. Well, now that we're in 2021, I don't know about you, 
but 85% of all the customer service interactions that I have with and I know that my family members have with aren't necessarily with chatbots. There's still a lot of reading of knowledge articles. They're still reaching out to on-site premises to get help. There's a lot of phone calls. There's going to websites. There's many different ways that we're interacting with customers that have absolutely nothing to do with chatbots. So I think this technology and this fear that somehow our content is going to be replaced by chatbots is not true. And I would also put forth for those of you that are working with chatbots, such as myself a few years ago, one tends to notice that when you're putting them together, you have to write so much content and figure out the different journeys and responses that will occur in a chatbot that it probably is a boon to what we do as technical communicators to write more forms of content that will be displayed in a different format. Another kind of prediction that Gartner likes to put forth that kind of makes people anxious in our field is that 40% of new app development projects will include AI co-developers by 2022. And that can kind of mean that OG, artificial intelligence, is somehow going to start developing the applications that we're working with. And my goodness, somehow AI is going to start spitting out content and replace us as writing content. Well, if we take a step back, do you and your organizations and the project teams that you're on or the software development teams or the scrum teams are 40% really go into any kind of AI co-development or using co-developers that are based with artificial intelligence? I would put forth probably not. I know for my company, we do offer a form of artificial intelligence for our customers called Einstein, but 40% of R&D at my company is not necessarily any, involved in any co-development using artificial intelligence. So I don't think that we necessarily at this point in our careers have to uh, worry in our discipline that that's gonna overtake our profession either. But this does kind of lead to these marketing ideas that are thrown out, what the market is for tech comm, what the market is for technology. And I think that has a lot of technical writers ask, what is up with marketing? Not only is marketing putting together these kinds of ideas of where things are headed, but they're frequently wrong with their, where things actually head to. And there's also this notion that what is with marketing? Because if we're writing content as tech commerce and they're writing content as content marketers, why are we siloed? Why are we not using the same tools to write this content and share it? Why are we not being invited to marketing meetings where we can help out with the knowledge that we have with applications and software and technology that might make them be more successful with marketing content? I think we need to have kind of a moment where we step back and we ask ourselves, perhaps we need a little bit of an agile retrospective meeting, or we need to air our dirty laundry, or maybe we need to have just a good old fashioned group therapy session where we think a little bit more of what is going on with marketing and what is going on with tech comm and identify some of the problems that we have with each other and take a look at the different perspective of what each discipline has problems with. And let's start by looking at the problems with Marcom from a tech comm perspective. I think a tech commer could sit back and say, marketing, these are the problems with you. First of all, your content is inaccurate. You're writing all these fanciful stories about what our technology does, and it's not necessarily even true. And you know what, marketing? Another issue that we have is that you change terms on a whim. Our customers are confused because one week our product is called one thing, the next week it's called something else. What is going on with you people over in marketing? Marketing, another problem that we have with you from a tech comm perspective is you don't understand the product. We in tech comm are involved with the teams building these wonderful applications and software and platforms and what have you, but you aren't. And you get to set forth and put out all these customer stories out there about what this technology can solve, but maybe it can't solve those things you're writing about. Marketing, you frankly don't care about customer service. And you know why? Because as a tech commer, we receive the customer tickets and bugs that we have to solve in documentation because you're putting forth ideas out there that just aren't in a factual reality of what this application can do. And marketing, we're really peeved because you get all the praise, you get all the resources, and you get all the visibility, 
But we in TechCom put forth all this accurate content, which really is showing the state of what our organization is building. But TechCom, perhaps we wouldn't be so flustered with our marketing friends if we knew what the purpose and goal of marketing really is. And as put forth by Robert Rose, a great marketer and writer, he has mentioned that in content marketing, the asset is the audience. It is not the content. And this is why marketing has almost carte blanche to throw spaghetti at walls and put content out there to see what this audience is going to gravitate to, what this audience needs, what this audience likes. And that's very different than the kinds of content and goals that we in TechCom have. And why don't we look at that? If we could step back and continue our little therapy session and you know, the problem with you, TechCom, from a marketing perspective, is your content is boring. Online help, API developer guides, release notes. Who wants to read that unless you're in a serious jam or, or suffering from insomnia? TechCom, another problem with you is that you avoid risks or changes. When was the last time you really took a step back and tried to do something new instead of writing in the same old format that you've always written in. Another marketing perspective that's a problem with TechCom is that we don't understand the business. Sure, you understand your little pocket of development and what features going out the door, but TechCom, you don't see the thousand foot view of what we're trying to accomplish in this organization. TechCom, you don't care about sales or prospects. Yeah, you care about customer support and we hear that endlessly, but you're not writing content that accentuates what we can do or that gets people fired up and excited to actually buy what we're selling that makes your paycheck. Techcom, you whine too much, you complain a lot, and you're just never happy. And maybe that's why we don't invite you to our meetings. Now, Marcom could maybe understand us a little bit better if they understood what the main purpose and goal of our content is, which has been put forth by Mark Baker beautifully in his book, Every Page is Page One. And he states that the goal of TechCom is to enable correct action, meaning accurate content to help a customer be successful at a specific action or what's called a job to be done. The result of these two camps, and we're not innocent if you're in Marcom or TechCom, none of us are innocent here, is complete content confusion for customers. You know, marketing is throwing together their eBooks, these white papers, social media campaigns, social media posts, graphics and videos, and endless websites. And then TechCom, we're putting together online help, API guides, an assortment of user assistance on screen, various implementation guides, and UI text. And customers are just sailing through this ocean of content, and they're saying, what the F? I just want to know why I bought this thing, what it does, and how I can be successful with it. I don't want to spend all this time searching through all this content just because you people can't get your act together and put good content together that just helps me do the job it is that needs to be done. Well, I think we can all agree that to some degree, marketing and techcom has failed with what Peter Drucker has mentioned in his famous book, The Practice of Management, which is the purpose of business is to create a customer. It seems like with all the content that's being published out there in the world, that we're all creating customer confusion, not necessarily customers. The experience that we're cultivating with all this content, no matter what side of the fence you're on, is madness, it's ultimate confusion. And I think when you look at your own customer experiences across many different technologies, you too could sit back and say, I just wanna know how to do this thing. And I don't really care who created it, I don't care what tools I use to create it. And I don't care if they're from marketing, if they're a technical writer, I don't care if it's you know, a little child that's in the back of the room somewhere with a crayon. I just wanna know how to do well by this thing I purchased. And this is gonna lead to the second illusion, which is marketing doesn't like us and marketing doesn't like tech comm specifically. And I'm hoping to share with you in this segment how this is an illusion because things changed at my company 
by the kind of accidental creation of an e-learning platform that brought Marcom and Techcom together to create something rather special. And this e-learning platform called Trailhead started when a developer marketer by the name of Josh Burke was sitting back about, I think, six years ago. And he thought, what if we can make technical content weird and fun and engaging or fun gauging? Get it? And he was thinking, what can we do that would remove kind of the stodginess of the typical technical content that's out in the world? What if we added a little bit of humor? What if we did something where we had contractions and weren't focused on business casual? What could we accomplish if we added some kind of gamified system that made people earn something like an online badge by going through some kind of content? Josh and others started asking more questions, which started building this e-learning platform. And more questions came about, like, what if we welcome customers with mascots and characters? And people thought, we're a CRM company. You want mascots and characters? I thought, why don't we take a risk? Why don't we try something different? In fact, what if we not only have mascots that kind of represent what we're trying to do here, but what if when people were going through technical content, they came across kind of personas or guides, these characters that we call Salesforce Landians, which could re represent a customer support person or represent a salesperson or an administrator or developer. And they can watch these characters kind of go through how to learn something on our platform. And what if by having kind of 15 minutes to an hour, these people can learn at their own pace and not have to do something immediately, learn on their own time. And what if customers can choose what and when to learn? What if we had a slick dashboard that kind of modularized aspects of our technology where people could do a deep dive on a specific feature or take a larger view on the Salesforce platform? And what if we took a bit of that storytelling from marketing, kind of the business story, and mixed it with instructional content from technical writers or tech common kind of put it in a blender and mixed it up and offered both together in these bite-sized chunks so that people could get the, boast, the best, excuse me, of both worlds of content in kind of this holistic way. What if not only we did that, but then we gave them creative projects to continue learning that kind of goes beyond just the Salesforce technology. Of course, it will help reinforce what they're learning of our technology, but what if we also do things in the soft skill level. So we can show them how to build a Mars communication uplink, which will reinforce the technical skills, but we can also give them information that would be useful for soft skills, such as how to cultivate the quality at work or give presentations or lead or something of that nature. So we can be a free learning area that helps improve skills across the board. And what if when people earn these badges by going through this mix of Marcom and Techcom content, that they have a type of online profile or resume that they could use that shows what they've earned when, it tells about the kinds of skills they've acquired, and they can show a prospective employer or they can show their manager of how they're adding to their career, excuse me, their career tool skills so that they could advance themselves in their profession. So Trailhead has become part of an overall content strategy for Marcom and Techcom at my company. We haven't obliterated all the white papers, the social media posts, the online help, and the release notes that my company puts forth. Trailhead is this aspect of all of those things kind of put together so that when somebody has a bit of time on their own or that they want to learn a new skill that they're thinking of, they can do that without going to older forms of content that may not be most suited for that. And we've also noticed that Trailhead isn't the end all be all to all the content needs out there. And why I mentioned it's part of a larger strategy is if somebody has an immediate problem with our technology, I can guarantee you they're not gonna wade through 20 minutes to an hour of earning a Salesforce Trailhead badge to figure out how to solve their problem. What they're probably gonna do is search on Google or some other search technology to find an online help article, a knowledge article, or an implementation guide, or something in an API guide for a call or object that will help solve that business problem immediately. On the flip side, 
an executive making a business decision about perhaps purchasing a technology isn't necessarily going to want to earn a badge on Trailhead to figure out if that's the best type of technology for their organization. They're probably going to turn to a white paper or a case study or something of that vein. That being said, though, we have heard that there have been business decisions by executives made specifically on what Trailhead has to offer. And there have been times where people have had a fire drill at work with a technology and they've solved that problem with Trailhead content. Trailhead is not the end all and be all. It's part of this larger pocket of information that's available to all. And the reason that there's this kind of illusion that marketing hates us, especially for the tech car commerce at, at Salesforce, is that when you look at the stats of the Salesforce economy, and what I mean here by Salesforce economy is the ecosystem. It's not just our company, it's all the partners and developers that are building things off of our tools for their businesses. That 4.2 million new jobs are gonna be in this ecosystem by 2024. And the stats I'm sharing with you are from IDC research as well as Velour research. And when you think about it, there's 4.2 million new jobs and people need to learn these skills, they're not necessarily all going to turn to marketing content to skill up. They're going to have to learn specific tasks, which is what TechCom is going to provide for them. There's also put forth by IDC that $1.2 trillion of new business revenue is going to be generated within the next few years in this ecosystem in order to support that kind of revenue flow, in order to support the businesses growing off this. They're going to need tech commerce to guide them through the paths of what they need to do to get their businesses up and running. Sure, they can look at the marketing story and understand the larger perspective, but there's going to be people like developers that are going to have to piece together API integrations in order to be successful. And that's why TechCom is definitely not hated by marketing in these scenarios. There's also currently 3 million people on Trailhead that are consistently learning a variety of subjects. And those uh, trailblazers, as we call them, as they self-proclaim themselves as trailblazers, are needing more content. They're needing to learn more so that they can further their careers in business. And TechCom is going to be able to provide that for them. There's also currently 35 million of these badges have already been earned. And as more badges are earned, more content, again, needs to be created. And who's going to do that? It's going to most likely be TechCom with a smattering of Marcom along the way. One out of three trailblazers has a new high-paying job. We have evidence from IDC as well as, again, Valoria Research that trailblazers are using our content to get new careers. There's evidence that this kind of learning is not going away because people are seeing their salaries increase by utilizing this content. And 50% of learners have received a promotion or have had help with a promotion by getting new skills with this content that TechCom is creating along with Marcom at my organization. The economics of all this and the numbers I just showed you are pretty overwhelming. The economics and story helping, which is a phrase Robert Rose had used, have helped generate organically this community that's risen about from this content. And what's interesting, for those of you who go to Dreamforce, which is my company's big annual user conference and it takes over San Francisco, there's almost 200,000 people descend upon the city to, to learn about what's going on with Salesforce and technology. Uh, it's pretty interesting to see how this e-learning platform helped rebrand the entire company, that there was such a customer demand for this learning content and such a customer ask that it's helped pivot our corporate image into providing this information to help people with their careers. Everything with the decor, everything with the uh, presentations, everything with the setting, everything with the swag that's, that's out there is based on this content created by TechCom and Marcom. And I think for many of us in the TechCom field, it's pretty unusual to see our content elevated is this really important identity for an entire corporate brand. And that's what's happened kind of accidentally with my company. Another thing that's quite interesting is a number of the people in this community started uh, connecting with each other on Twitter and other social media platforms. And they created things such as Salesforce Saturdays, where they 
have by themselves organized meetings where they get together, they earn badges, they talk about their careers, and they ask others for advice on where they can skill up and what badges on Trailhead that they should earn. And uh, this is all done with themselves. And that leads to them asking us to write more content for them. It's also interesting to see that uh, they have gravitated towards uh, some of this branding very interestingly. There's a uh, kind of a, a, a hoodie that has been going around that some of you may have seen that says uh, Trailblazer on it. It's black in color. And then somehow that got elevated to the golden hoodie, which is a gold lame hooded sweatshirt of sorts that those who have really helped out the community with learning can win when I believe they get voted upon for um, MVP and, and most useful community members and things of that nature. So all these things have kind of happened by bubbling up uh, with customer ass of our content and trying an experiment that includes Marcom and Techcom together. And now that hopefully I've showed you this illusion that marketing hates Techcom uh, in this space is not necessarily true and that they need each other, I want to talk about this illusion that I hear a lot through technical writers that Techcom just gets no respect. And what I would put forth, and I'm sorry, I keep saying put forth, I'm putting forth a lot today, is to avoid the docosaur mentality. And the docosaur is some colleagues of mine that are tech writers were talking about this mentality that we've seen in our field where some writers think, you know, I'm a technical writer. No one cares about what I write. I'm not really going to contribute much because I don't get invited to the meetings anyway. I'm, you know, I just get paid to write this content and I'm going to sit in my cube and I'm going to write this technical content that nobody's even going to read and I'm just going to do my job. And it's that kind of mentality that I think has done a disservice to our discipline and has done a disservice to what we represent in organizations. And I think that could be why some of us feel like we don't get the respect we deserve. One of the quotes I like to leverage through hard times by uh, Charles Bukowski is what matters most is how well you walk through the fire. And the reason I bring this up is I have been in some meetings with technical writers and I've been in some meetings with marketers and we've been together. And frankly, I've been astonished at the lack of, um, you could say political acumen that some of my technical writer friends have with their body language, a lot of sign. <sighs> You know, a lot of kind of these quips thrown out to deprecate or uh, kind of dismiss maybe what a marketing is putting forth, kind of not a really playing well with others in the sandbox, if you will. And I'm not saying that that's everyone in the technical writing field, but I have seen enough of it where I kind of feel like some of my friends and colleagues aren't doing the best for our brand, for our discipline to work well with others in order to really showcase and highlight what it is that we can bring to the table in an organization. So how well are we walking through the fire with other teams at our companies? And how are we defining our roles? How do you define your role every day? Do you do more than right? I was surprised when I was brought on at my company that we were encouraged to not just write technical documentation, but to participate in quality assurance, to speak at conferences or customer events. There's this whole idea that we're more than just technical writers. And, and are you doing more than just writing? Also, do you build relationships beyond doc? When you're thinking about your own kind of brand with our discipline, are you speaking with solution engineers and salespeople? Are you letting them know what you do? Do you have almost an elevator pitch that is something along the lines of, you know what I do for the company? I help customers adopt our technology and I reduce the likelihood that they're going to leave as paying customers from our company versus just saying, oh, I just write doc. That doesn't really do much for them to understand what we really can bring to the table in a monetary way for the business. So what is the relationship building that you're doing? Also, do you contribute to customer advocacy? Do you go talk to customers at events that are out there? Do you let the customers know what you do? Do you let the customers know what you write? Do you let the customers see, and this is something I'd like to see more of in, in our field, is the incredible knowledge that we have of software applications. I, I feel that we often focus just on this content but when people see that we know more about the application often than the subject matter experts, they're kind of blown away. And I think we do a disservice by holding that information just in a content realm and not sharing it more widely in other ways. And again, do you share your knowledge across the organization? 
um, being a subject matter expert, do you do things like perhaps show product managers where they may not know everything about the technology they're in charge of? Do you do anything with customer support or you find some key pieces of information that you've put together that maybe analytics have shown are really getting a lot of visibility and letting the customer support teams see that content. I've been surprised when I've been invited to such meetings that people that are interacting with customers will talk about, oh, this customer's mad because they said that our content doesn't have this. And, and I'm like, no, our, I know exactly where that is. And then I'll share that piece of content with those people on other teams. And they're, they're just like, oh my goodness, how did you find this? How did, it's like, it's just right there. <laughs> so what are we doing to spread our knowledge and information across the organizations that we're in? And do we continually learn the language of businesses? I mean, every once in a while, I find myself reading a marketing book or you know, an MBA in a box or something like that, just so that I understand the terminology that's being used in this gigantic organization that I'm in. I find that if I'm able to mimic some of those terms or understand them, that I can be more effective and see the perspective of these business leaders so that I can help them see my perspective if I'm trying to influence something with content or a business decision likewise. And do you volunteer solutions and creativity to stakeholders? Uh, one thing that I saw years ago that was fascinating was there was a writer on my team and she had an idea of putting together this comic book about her technology. And it would sound like an interesting thing, but it was like, oh, it's a little risky. We probably shouldn't do that. It's really creative. It's not quite what technical writing's about. And so it wasn't moved on. And you know what happened? A few years later, a customer put together a comic book of our technology. And everyone was like, that's the coolest thing ever. That's so great. So maybe if we used our creativity a little bit more, we'd be more successful as advocates to get more respect that we think we need. And the obstacle is the way. Yes, Mr. Holiday, well-known marketer, especially in the Austin, Texas area, has uh, taken this idea from uh, Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius, which is the impediment to action is the action. In other words, that if we're blocked or we think that we're not getting the respect we deserve, well, what are we doing action-wise to change that? And as I kind of wind down my talk and you're wondering, you know, what does this get no respect? What does this have to do, you know, with chatbots and artificial intelligence and our jobs? And well, I have seen that there has been no technology that's necessarily replacing us. The big advancements that have happened seem to be from human creativity, like Trailhead. That was just a bunch of questions asked by some people in marketing and tech comm, and it blew up into this gigantic thing that took over a giant software company's brand and identity. Who would have thought? And that was from human creativity. That wasn't from technology. So I think we should kind of think about what it is that we can bring to the table of these organizations by putting maybe more of our humanities degrees background to use and, and letting people see more of what we can do. And if the ideas get shot down, so be it. At least we're taking some risks and trying something new, which could lead to an accidental success. And the career vision that I want to mention has to do with the co-founder of my company, Parker Harris, and the COO of R&D, Andrea Lezek. And I'm not sharing them just because I've worked with them and because they're ultimately my bosses at Salesforce. But I think it's fascinating to note that Parker Harris, who leads technology, many people think, oh, he must have a computer science degree. Uh-uh. Parker Harris has a degree in English literature. Andrea Lezek, people think, oh, she must have a computer science degree too because she's leading R&D at Salesforce. Uh-uh. Andrea Lezek has a background in linguistics. These are people that know how to communicate. These are people that have written documentation. These are people that have actually spent time in the tech comm space and their careers have taken them to areas that are probably beyond, uh, you know, the, the, the visions beyond my wildest dreams. And I think it's interesting to see that there's people that have our backgrounds that write content or have written content that have gone on to do these incredibly gigantic things. And I think all of us are capable of that in the tech comm space if we use our creativity and take some risks. And now I'm winding down. You know, when we come to the takeaways from a conversation and a talk, it's, the, it's time to end. And the first takeaway I want to share is content creators and creativity are invaluable. That's the thing that's separating us from the technology. And that's the things that we should look at as to how we can bring more value, no matter where we are. Also, marketing needs tech comm to thrive. 
marketing may not invite us to the table all the times, but I can see across many different companies that the technical writers are kind of writing the nuts and bolts that then you could say is pilfered and utilized across all kinds of different content that other people are creating. But techcom is used and marketing uses it to thrive. And refurbish your role to get respect. If you're in techcom and you don't think that you're getting respect, what is it that you can do? What are the walls that you think you can potentially break through? What are the things you can change with your behavior? What is it that you can highlight or help market within your organization to get that respect that perhaps you deserve in your organization versus just saying, you know, it's just our field. We're just tech writers. That's just how it is. I don't think that's the case. And those are the takeaways I leave you with. And now I'm excited to get to my favorite part of any presentation or talk, which is the Q&A. And hopefully I can answer all your questions. And if not, please feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn or connect with me on Twitter or send me an email at my email address here. And hopefully I can answer the questions that you have. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. This this all really hit the nail on the head for me and I feel called out and also seen. <laughs> um, but it, they're good reminders for um, kind of opening your arms to these different organizations within your company and trying to bridge that gap and, and using their knowledge for good on your side and vice versa, because in the end, we're all, we're all in it together. So these are good reminders for me. I hope for other people as well. <laughs> um, I have a question just to start things off. Um, I'm all for making tech content more approachable and less formal, uh, but my team really isn't. And I think this is um, just an old way of thinking of technical writing and tech com. And it has its basis, sure, but it's a prevalent kind of idea in my organization. Do you have any tips to help me bridge that gap or start to introduce those ideas or those approaches with my team and in my content um, or help others to see that this can kind of make our stuff more understandable and engaging for our audience? One of the things that we did at my company was put together a series of, and I don't know if this would work at your company, is to put together a series of uh, customer cases, almost like people see in the marketing realm. Well, there'd be a, a portrait of a customer and a quote that says, you know, my, my whole world's changed because I'm using this technology. Well, we went out with our user researchers and we got some key quotes as well as pictures of our customers where they said, this documentation help me solve this multi-million dollar problem. Your content helped me pass the certification. So now I'm making a six figure salary and I didn't even have a high school diploma. Those are the kinds of things that we've gone out and gathered from our customers so that we can put case, cases together, really case studies that enable executives to better understand the value of our content. So they can start seeing what it is that our content can do versus just thinking, oh, you just write online help. So that could be one area. Um, analytics are great. There's a figure that we use on my team. I can't share it externally, but we save our business tens of millions of dollars annually in support costs. And when you start throwing these kind of figures around about how much money you're saving the organization or how much money you're helping the business bring in, that perks up executive leadership's ears. And those are great ways to help market what it is that you do at your organization. So if you're not doing those kinds of things, you don't have those stats now, uh, I recommend that you try to find them or you try to piece them together so that you can wow your executives. So it seems like I need evidence. I need, I need some real, real, not only data, but um, information from real people who use it. So I'm gonna have to do some digging. <laughs> Does anyone else have any questions that they want to surface to Gavin or comments even or appreciation or all hailing praise? <laughs> that was really good. So can you share some specific anecdotal ways that um, people got together virtually to trailblaze or build mascots or, you know, whatever <laughs> that journey might be? Yeah. Uh from what I understand, a lot of the community outreach has been uh, organic. It wasn't something that my company put together. There were community meetups and things of that nature. And whenever there were volunteers, similar to like a write the docs meetup, there were Salesforce customers that came together and wanted to host events and get people to learn about certain things. 
that my company did support those efforts. And if they needed speakers or they needed some information or something along that, that way, that was always provided. But as far as how things came together on, on Twitter, especially, I don't know if anyone has the, the best answer for that. People got strangely excited over earning these badges. And that was kind of the thing um, in the background was, if I understand it correctly, was there was a first iteration of Trailhead. It was kind of quietly put out on a website. And there were, I think, just a handful of badges people could earn. And they didn't know what was going to happen with it. And I don't think there was much announcement about it. And all of a sudden, all these people earned these badges. They demanded more. And, and, and the stats, I couldn't even believe how many people were using this thing. And, and those, again, that data made an easy decision to add more resources and investment in this kind of thing. And as far as how that hooked up with the community events, I think people saw a way that they could participate together to work on earning these badges, to work on learning uh, the, the information they needed to get certain um, Salesforce certifications. So it was kind of like a, a mentor-mentee thing. People that already had certifications were helping those trying to get certified, and they were using Trailhead as kind of a tool to do it, but it wasn't the only way to get certified. So it really was, in my understanding, just an organic thing that happened. And um, it all was from taking this risk of trying this new form of content and throwing it out there on the web. Um, I don't know if that answered your question. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, get, I, I was kind of thinking too, um, within the company, you know, like scheduling meetings. And when we're all so busy, it just feels like a precious resource of time, but making it more fun to invest the time, just different. Mm. You know, in the old days, we bring coffee and cookies or whatever, you know? Yeah, no, that's very much what was happening at this, these community events. And the community events were interesting because they, they were also networking events. I think very similarly to a lot of the content conferences that we all attend and participate in, you get to know what person's doing at one company, why they do that, ask them questions. And that was already happening. And it just became, um, this content became kind of a better unifying force for all those conversations, I think, where people could work on something together. They could have an opinion, not just on the technology, but have an opinion on things that affected their careers, knowledge that could help improve their careers in this e ecosystem. And it just took off like wildfire. Hey, Gavin? I have a really quick, just logistical question for you, which is um, some people are wondering if they, they took a screenshot of some of your slides and they just wanted to know if you were okay with sharing it on social media. Yeah, I think that's fine. Everything that I've shown has been vetted by PR at my company. So I don't think it'd be anything too shocking to anyone. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for asking. We have um, a couple more questions if, if we have time there. Um, I would actually like to ask something here. I put it in the chat during the talk and then someone was kind enough to call it out um, at least a, a bit muddledly. And there, there's a couple of other good questions in the chat. So I apologize for preempting them, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, this question occurred to me fairly early in the talk. Um, so it digresses a bit from some of the direction that you took but to take the larger documentation um, marketing relationship sort of to operate, to ask a question at that layer of abstraction. Um, in 2013, at the first Write the Docs conference, Adam Duvander gave a talk called Documentation as Marketing. Hmm. And while um, I, I'm curious if you could talk about that idea you don't need to know anything about Adam or his talk, um, but I wonder if you um, could maybe sort of think out loud a little bit about the idea of what technical writers do, doc produce documentation of whatever sort, um, as a form of marketing. I don't know the talk, but I would agree with the premise wholeheartedly. I think that most organizations they don't see the, the content they create, whether it's from marketing or technical documentation teams or training, they don't see it um, often as an asset, as a business asset, right? And I love thinking about Apple products, right? When you get an Apple laptop, the experience that you have 
of getting that box and then you open it up and there's like this tiny little piece of content. It looks like a business card that tells you to, to click power on or something like that. And you're kind of giddy like, oh, wow, you know, it's, like, it's like a treasure chest you're opening up. Everything that you're experiencing as a customer is making you decide if you want to buy this again or not, right? So when you're a customer and you're angry and you're irritated and you can't solve this problem and the customer support line doesn't answer and you go to some outdated knowledge article that's not solving your problem, that too is an experience from a customer. And then you start thinking, you know, I'm never buying this crap again from this company. I am not renewing my technology subscription with these bozos because they can't even, I think we as content creators have to be the ones, unfortunately, to explain <laughs> to people that are in business that this is part of your business. <laughs> this is, this is how, what customers are experiencing. And you may be trying to cut costs. You may be thinking that content isn't something that's part of what you're selling, but it is. And it's up to us and our discipline to make that argument, to make it as frequently as we can, because I don't think there's an MBA course out there that's explaining to a lot of these decision makers how content is part of their business. And um, what I've seen has mostly to do with analytics. Um, but I have seen key businesses, and, and you'll notice that really successful businesses tend to have really good content, that they're investing in it. They don't necessarily see it as, as a, um, a cost center. They see it as something that's an investment. And um, I think showing executives content that does that helps them better understand why they should do this. And I think one of the reasons Trailhead has been very successful at Salesforce is because as I mentioned, our co-founder, he studied English. He knows good content. <laughs> he, he's, he's an understanding person of the written word and it's power of an experience. And I think that goes a long way for some of the business decisions that were probably made in support of this accidental e-learning platform that took off. And um, every business doesn't necessarily probably need something that's like a trailhead e-learning platform, but every business should look at how you don't know who creates your content that your customer is going to see. You don't know when that customer is going to see it and you don't know how they're going to see it, but it's all reflective of your brand. And it's all reflective of the relationship they're going to have with your brand. And if you dismiss that, then you're dismissing your customers and you're dismissing the likelihood of respecting them. And you're dismissing the fact that they can take their money elsewhere. And um, I don't know who else can make those arguments other than us and our marketing compatriots to help the decision makers understand that. I would just follow that up by really quickly noting that there are very occasionally and rarely um, those um, less less often found than unicorn valued companies, um, companies whose founders value docs to the point where the tech writing team keeps growing without having to even make any much of an argument for it. Yes, exactly, Barry. Um, I work for another such company. <laughs> they exist, a rare, I agree, but they exist. Maybe that's why they're successful because they understand <laughs> that everything is a customer experience, no matter when, where, how the customer hits that content. It's, it's part of their brand. Um, maybe that's why those companies are unicorns. I don't know. Let's see if I can get another question in or two. Um, Lois has a question. How do you get past barriers thrown up by your own company? For example, services folks don't want technical writers to talk to their customers. Hmm. I hasten to add that that is not my current situation, but it was in the past. Hmm. Yeah, I, a lot to be said about business culture. I, I feel sorry for organizations that are uh, exclusive and, and not inclusive of all the talents that they employ. It seems like a bad business decision to me, but hey, I'm not a CEO at a company, right? I think one of the wonderful things that we experimented with in, our, in the earlier days of my company was, and, and this will date me, but that we once were in the waterfall mold model of software development and we transitioned to agile software development in 06 or 07. Uh, it really had a transparency uh, where everyone 
was able to give their opinions and planning meetings and retrospective meetings and daily stand-up meetings. And I think that did a wonderful service for the culture that we're in, where people got to um, highlight their skills and highlight their knowledge and highlight the importance of their roles in ways that perhaps other organizations um, weren't allowing. So in those scenarios, I could be in a meeting with somebody in marketing or a meeting in support, and they could learn from me what our content is doing, why we're creating it this way, how it's useful to customers. And so that to help them see the business value. Whereas if organization where they're like, no, you're the tech writer, you can't be in this meeting. Well, then how am I supposed to highlight my business value? How am I supposed to explain to people what to do? Uh, the only way that I think one can get through some of those barriers is uh, if I may use another trendy business word, I'd just be proactive and you know say, you know what, I'm going to invite some of these people to meetings, or I'm going to casually, if we were not in a pandemic, run into them in the hallway or talk to them as they're getting coffee and just say, hey, you know, this, you know, I, my name's Gavin and I, I write the, the trailhead content for X, Y, and Z. And I understand that you're in marketing or support, you know, what is it you think we could do better or just engaging with those people so that they not only uh, know what you do and who you are, but hey, that's not a meeting, right? That's an informal, impromptu relationship building talk that anyone could do. So maybe that's a way to move forward with some of those barriers or volunteer to, to present at certain meetings uh, what it is your business value is, what it is your team does. We've done a lot of that at my company where our writers will have a deck ready and they have a whole um, kind of marketing pitch of what our content strategy is, what our menu of content options are for people to choose from, what our customers like, uh, things of that nature, how we save and support costs, how um, we help other teams write content because they're using the content that we've put out in release notes or other things. So I think identifying the, the business value that you have, and, and even though I think for a lot of us, Marketing often can seem kind of sleazy or political, um, and it can be, but I think marketing ourselves and marketing our teams in these organizations is really the way to try to bust through some of those barriers. All right, I think, let's see, we'll do one more. Patrick has a question. What's your opinion on tech writers acting as content creators for the community? Or should it be developer created content? And Patrick, you may have to clarify if I read that wrong or if you had more information to add. Yeah, uh, so as a, as a content uh, curator, uh, so uh, my, uh, my, my company, uh, Pega Systems, which is actually more or less in the same sort of field as Salesforce, just more on a uh, broader enterprise type of uh, uh, sales base. Uh, we are kind of launching this initiative now where uh, we want both uh, developers and um, our, the users of our products, our, our, our clients, to produce documentation for us, and then the tech yeah. writers would act as content creator uh, curators uh, for that content, and then sort of envelop that uh, into our uh, tech doc base. Um, so we're kind of uh, baiting a wiki right now, but um, that's probably going to move forward as a more legitimate. Uh, uh, a portion of our documentation. Uh, and I'd kind of like to see if, if a, a, a Salesforce had done anything of a similar initiative or if, if you've ever heard of something like that occurring. Yeah, thanks for the question. I have heard of companies doing that. I've heard of companies doing it um, with not great outcome. Um, I do know that there's parts of my company that have dabbled in that. Uh, my immediate team does have um, some community outreach on our, our forums and, and places of that nature. But I think what has been kind of the issue that I've um, witnessed and not necessarily with my company is that when you're le uh, leveraging content that your writers have not created, um, you don't know how much you're gonna get. You don't know how the style is gonna be that matches your corporate brand you may not have a great way of maintaining it or figuring out how to validate that it's always accurate for folks. And then that leads back to the poor customer experience, right? Where some random customer lands on this community created content, tries to use it, and it looks like maybe the company created it. So they're mad at the company. They're like, oh, the company, I can't rely on this content because this is bad. But then meanwhile, the technical content seems like, actually it's an online forum and the forum, the community, we didn't really create it. 
I think um, that can pose some major issues with relationship building with customers. But then, right, and this, I can't really speak very well towards the development space because I know developers are a lot more active on forums and sharing information that helps each other with code and what have you. I think, though, that there's probably an um, intuitive understanding in those spaces that there's room for um, error, there's room for improvement, there's room for helpfulness, and it's probably not going to be held against the company um, and with that audience. <laughs> Um, but I, I do know of some colleagues that worked at some um, well-known companies that did dabble in what you were speaking about, and it, it ended up not being good, and they ended up, I think, having to move on from that experiment. And I don't know all the reasons why, um, other than some of the branding issues, perhaps, that I mentioned, um, but I don't have personal direct experience with that. Yeah, I just want to add a little bit. I mean, I, I work for a company who has open source documentation and code. And so I think one of the keys here is to really, um, really to focus part of your writing team on curating or on prettying up, on revising that content that's created by the community. It's not something that, you know, writers can do alongside their existing work all of the time. You have to really create a culture in which those writers are the gatekeepers and they are taking the tone of the company and they are really forming that community created content into the vision of the company, into the tone and the voice of the company, instead of just taking it full stock and barrel, right? So you really have to have writers curate that content with um, the intention of making it their own, right? While still giving credit to the to the community member. So um, it's also a challenge. I know Barry also is commenting, she does this all day, every day. So this is part of her, her work as well. Yeah, I would like to add to, based on some of the comments, and I'm sorry if you see me kind of, I'm trying to like look <laughs> comments, but yeah, it is, it's a strange tightrope to walk, right? Because you wanna build trust and rapport with your customers. You do wanna interact with them. Uh, it's how much of that interaction, though, is going to really be suitable and suit tech comm needs versus actually create a mess. I mean, there can be situations where you get somebody who endlessly complains on forums about certain content issues, and maybe it's not even your content, it's forum generated, but then it makes your team look bad because this individual somehow thinks it's your company creating this content. So it's a really fine line between um, gathering trust, building relationships, inviting certain folks in um, that are, are probably um, like to take a step back and I don't mean to manalogue here, but we do have key MVP community folks at Salesforce that I do know that we've brought into the fold, ask their opinions, ask with content, what do they need, do full user research because they've been so consistent with their community activity and their, their knowledge is so grand versus maybe some of the folks that just jump in every once in a while, post a complaint and then take off and don't do anything. So it's, it's a tightrope. I don't know what the best solution is. Uh, thanks very much for, for both of your answers. Yeah, it's uh, something to keep in mind as you know my company kind of embarks on this initiative. So uh, uh, thank you very much for, for the insight. Yeah, and they're like you know, linked in the chat is um, our a previous meetup. This is kind of about this topic. So uh, feel free to, to view that. I think that might be helpful for you, Patrick. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think we're going to be able to get to all the questions today. Um, we may do the breakout rooms for a few minutes um, if people are still around. But I just want to, one, thank Gavin for being here and speaking to us. It feels like this topic hit home for a lot of people and is something that's at the top of our working minds. Um, it's something we deal with at work all the time. Um, so thank you for being here and, and talking with us about it. Uh, right, thanks you, for the opportunity. Yeah, if y'all have questions that we didn't get to cover, um, feel free to tweet at Gavin. I'm sure he would be happy to continue that conversation. Um, and or on LinkedIn, his information is here. So um, thanks everyone for joining. Alyssa, do we wanna do breakout for a few?